evening, everyone. I'm Erica Wagner, and I am so delighted to be here with my friends at How To Academy and Penguin Live to speak with Malcolm Gladwell. So perhaps Malcolm Gladwell came to your attention when his book Outliers was published in 2008. That was the one in which he popularized the concept of taking 10,000 hours to become an expert in any field. Think of the Beatles perfecting their art in show after show at the Cavern Club. Gladwell, of course, put in his own 10,000 hours as a journalist for the Washington Post and as a writer for the New Yorker, where he still writes today. His first book, The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference, had its beginnings as an article there and first revealed his gift for finding the story within the story and discovering how the most important lessons for society, for science, for our interactions with each other are often hiding within plain sight. His work has made him, <clears throat> excuse me, his work has made him a stalwart of the New York Times bestseller list and I would say a household name. His other books include Blink, David and Goliath and Talking to Strangers and of course, he is the host of an absolutely wonderful podcast, Revisionist History. Like so many of you, I'm sure I'm addicted to that podcast, which Gladwell himself has described this way. It doesn't tell you that what you thought you knew is wrong. It told you that you didn't know the whole story. I'm way, way more interested in that second thing. The whole story is what I'm interested in. He has brought this sensibility to bear in his new book, The Bomber Mafia, which is published this very day. Part of the story it tells appears in three episodes of the most recent series of revisionist history. Its subtitle is A Story Set in War, and it is a tale of innovation and obsession of the men, and they were, for the most part, men, who decided they could change the way in which wars were fought. What if bombing could be made so accurate that battles on the ground became things of the past? What if destruction from the air could actually, it seems astonishing to say it now, save lives? Thomas E. Ricks in the New York Times has called it a kind of love song to the, US, to the United States Air Force and has also said, quite rightly, that it is a gripping tale. I can confirm it's an absolutely riveting story told with Gladwell's characteristic energy and aplomb fascinating and horrifying in equal measure. I'm so glad to be here with you this evening, Malcolm. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Erica. Um, so I would like to begin by asking you, I'm always fascinated when I listen to your podcast, when I read your books, how you find the stories that you want to tell. So how did you find this, this particular story? Uh, you know, I can never remember. Um, <laughs> I think it was because I was in Tokyo and went to see this little little museum on a side street inside what looked like a dentist's office, which was dedicated to the American firebombing of Tokyo in uh, in the spring of 1945. And it was incredibly moving and incredibly weird because it was this kind of homemade... Um, memorial um, to what seemed like what I would have thought was one of the most kind of devastating events in Japanese history. And um, I think I just sort of started from there and kind of worked backwards. Why was it that the United States <coughs> burned Tokyo almost to the ground in March of 1945? What led them to that decision? And I was going to ask you, I'm very glad you mentioned um, that that museum, it's the last in this in the book, I'm gonna hold up your book, um, which I'm so pleased to have a copy of. Um, the, it's the last photograph of the plate section of this book. It's called The Center of the Tokyo Raids and War Damage. And it really is extraordinary because it doesn't look like any other museum I've ever seen. Um, and I think it's important to kind of begin our talk with this Tell us about the that astonishingly destructive night in March, nineteen forty-five. Yeah, it's the, like I said, it's the end of the book. So we're starting with the, 
and then moving backwards. But it's um, the United States attacks Tokyo um, from Guam, which was the closest they could get to Japan, 1945. Remember, when the war breaks out, it was impossible for the United States to touch Japan from the air because Japan was just too far away. Even, even Hawaii, you know, you can't fly from Hawaii to Tokyo and back in a, in a bomber of the time, any plane of the time. It's too far. So America spends the first few years of the war trying to get closer to Japan. And in 1944, they finally uh, conquer what's called the Mariana Islands, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, which are within 1,500 miles of Tokyo, so within range, finally, of American bombers. And in an attempt to force the Japanese to surrender, they decide they will start launching these regular bombing attacks on Japan. And the first ferocious and brutal blow in that campaign is in early March of 1945 when the U.S. Air Force sends several hundred B-29 bombers loaded down with napalm, uh, a, uh, a, a bomb invented for the purposes of burning down Japanese cities because Japanese cities were made out of wood and tar paper. Um, they were tinderboxes. Um, a general named Curtis LeMay, Air Force general named Curtis LeMay, launches this insane assault on Tokyo where he drops tons of napalm on the city in the space of a few hours creates a firestorm that burns down 16 square miles of Tokyo and incinerates probably as many as 50 or 60,000 Japanese um, and when the planes come back to Guam after that attack the stench of burning flesh is so uh, powerful. They have to fumigate the planes to put wow. this in perspective. That event, that's where I started in this book. That's what I wanted to understand. That's where this book ends. Um, and the book is a, an attempt to answer the question of how on earth did the U.S. get there? Um, and you begin at the sort of other end of the spectrum in a way. You begin by telling the story of a remarkable man called Carl Norden who had a very different idea about what high altitude bombing could do. So maybe tell us a little bit about him and his very different vision from what happened on that Tokyo night. So Nor Norton is an engineer, a brilliant engineer, um, Dutch by birth, comes to America, and he becomes interested in what is the central problem of bombing, which is, there's a physics problem with bombing. You are in an airplane traveling 200, 300 miles an hour, um, 20,000 feet above the surface of the earth, uh, buffeted by winds that could be as strong as 150 miles an hour, could be one moment, and then the next moment could be zero. Um, in extreme temperatures, with clouds between you and your target, um, and if it's in wartime with enemy planes and enemy bullets flying hither and yon, under those circumstances, you have to drop a bomb that lands on its intended target. That's an impossible problem to solve, right? You, there's no way a human being unaided could accurately bomb under those circumstances. Um, even subtle things like, you know, the world is turning on its, slowly turning on its axis, right? Uh, a bomb might take from 20,000 feet, might take 30 seconds to, to hit the ground. In that time, the target will have moved, right? Because the, the Earth is turning. You got to factor that in. Not only factor in your own speed, but factor in the speed of the Earth as it rotates. I mean, I could go on. There's a So this guy Norden identifies the, I think it's, I've forgotten the exact number. I think it's something like 50 different variables that will affect the flight of a bomb and incorporates them all in a, a, in a analog computer, a kind of homemade device full of bells and whistle, whistles and buttons and gyroscopes. And, and he trains bombardiers for months in how to manipulate this insanely complicated device. 
with the expectation that if they can enter in all the right, do all the right things, enter in all the right variables, you should be able, you should know when to release the bomb in order that it, to maximize its chances of hitting a target. And he believes that, in fact, done, used properly, the Norden bombsite has solved the eternal problem of how to drop a bomb accurately from a plane. There's there's the famous description of it, I think, that it can drop a, a bomb from, I think, 30,000 feet into a pickle barrel. Yeah, 20, that's right. That's his marketing phrase. He believes he can put a bomb inside a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet. And a whole group of people in the U.S. military believe him and begin to craft a military strategy around that idea that you can drop bombs wherever you want to drop them. And the group that crafts that strategy around this dream of precision bombing are the Bomber Mafia, the subject of my book. And I'm going to ask you who they are. Before I do that, I just want to urge all of our audience members, um, I want you to have a chance to ask your questions as they occur to you. Please do drop them into the Q&A and I will come to them. Um, so yes, the, the Bomber Mafia. Who were these men and why was what they were doing so radical? So there are a group of men who, um, first of all, they're young men, which I say only because it's important to remember that in the 1930s, aviation was a young man's game. It was a brand new technology. Um, in the same way that if you walk into a startup in Silicon Valley, many of the people in that room will be under 20, under 30 rather. Um, back then, aviation was for the, the young, idealistic, technology obsessed um, kind of uh, kids. They were kids. They were in their 20s, and early 30s, these guys. There's a group of them, and they're teaching at an Air Force base in Montgomery, Alabama. So, and I, I say this with great affection because I like Montgomery. I was just there two weeks ago. Montgomery in the 1930s is a backwater. It's about as backwater as you can get in the United States. And they deliberately set up shop there because they don't want to be anywhere near the military establishment, because they intend to topple the military establishment. And they set up shop and they start dreaming about what precision bombing can do, because they think they can now wage wars without the kind of carnage that had um, characterized wars in the past. They think, oh, if I can drop a bomb with unerring ac accuracy, I don't need to wipe out an entire city to defeat my enemy. I don't need, and I don't need, nor do I need a army anymore, or a navy, or jeeps, or tanks, or artillery pieces, or machine guns, or anything. I can do everything from the air. I can have a fleet of bombers that can fly really high and really fast, it can't be touched, that can swoop down and take out exactly what they need to take out in order to immobilize the enemy. That's what they think the future of a war is. And they won't even need that many bombs. There's a really fascinating um, discussion, I think, of what would have to be done or what could be done to a city like New York in order to cripple the city. Oh, yeah, 14. They have a famous seminar in the 1930s in, in, in Montgomery where they, they figure out what happens if the Canadians attacked America. <laughs> and they wanted to force America to surrender by immobilizing its largest city, New York City. What would have to what would they have to do? And they calculate that all they would need is about, I think it's 14 bombs. Um, they would take out the aqueducts, so there'd be no more water in New York. They would take out the power plants, so there'd be no more electricity. And then they would take out the uh, the bridges so that you the, the the kind of freedom of movement to get in and out of the city would be severely compromised. And they their argument was that doing those three things would take about 14 bombs. And once you had dropped those 14 bombs, um, it would be over. That 8 million people in New York would say, wait a minute, we're, we're about to die of thirst, go hungry and, you know, and we can't possibly defeat an enemy who can come in with eight, 14 bombs and, and immobilize the country's largest city. So the belief is Amer eventually America under those circumstances would just sue for peace. How can you defend against that? 
And that was the bar mafia believed that. They didn't think that was pie in the sky. They thought that was how the next war not only ought to be fought, but would be fought, right, if they had their way. And they moved into positions of incredible authority in the U.S. Army in the, um, on, the, uh, on the eve of the Second World War to the point where everyone who was making decisions about the air war in the U.S. Army um, when America entered the Second World War was a member of the Bomber Mafia. I mean, they, they ran a show, and they try over the first four years of the war, five years of the war, um, to bring those bring that dream to reality. You say that all of these were were young men, that it was a young man's game. And one of the things I was reminded of reading this book that of course aviation itself hadn't been around for that long. The Wright brothers flew in 1903. So this is really less less than 40 years later. Mm -hmm. And when you introduce, I'm gonna ask you about Curtis LeMay, um, so many of these young men had a kind of seminal experience, I would say, of, of, of early flight. So tell us who Curtis LeMay was and, and how his passion for flying began. Curtis LeMay is the, depending on your perspective, either the hero or the villain of the, of the book. The Bomber Mafia were in one corner and Curtis LeMay was in the other. He was their great antagonist. And he thought that they were a group of, of, um, of impractical dreamers and dilettantes who uh, had a series of ridiculous notions about fighting wars that could never be made real. And he was, a, in contrast to the Bomber Mafia, who fancied themselves as intellectuals, men of learning and sophistication, um, fired by a moral vision. LeMay was like a working class kid from the streets of Columbus, Ohio, um, who was this kind of ruthless, unsentimental, anti-intellectual. He was all about doing, not about thinking. He did not, there are, I have interviews in the audiobook version of um, this book, you can hear his voice. You know, you the minute you listen to him, you understand him. He's a guy, he's got this kind of grunting, guttural, staccato delivery. And he, his impatience with people who, are, who he feels are not grounded in the real world is perceptible in all these interviews. And LeMay is, um, as the Bomber Mafia are taking over positions of authority in the Second World War, LeMay is simultaneously making a name for himself in Europe, prosecuting the U.S. half of the air war against Nazi Germany, and he he's he's in another world entirely. He's like rolling his eyes at what the bomber mafia is saying, and his belief is no no no. You just go in there and you just bomb the bejesus out of your enemy. Uh, anything else is a waste of time. Um, and his ideas come immediately and violently in conflict with people like Haywood Hansel and the and the bomber mafia. And he replaces. So what's what's Haywood Hansel's ar argument, as it were? Haywood Hansel's argument is we are to the point technologically where we do not need to use bombing in an indiscriminate manner. So he looked at the bombing that was going on by the Germans over London and by the English over Europe with horror. He's like, why are you leveling entire cities? Why are you firebombing Dresden? Why are you trying to defeat the Nazis by reducing R Berlin to rubble? And on and on and on. Why are you taking out a cathedral in the middle of some little medieval town in Germany? Why are you doing these things? This made no sense to Haywood Hansel. Hansel said, look, back in the 30s in Montgomery, Alabama, we had all these ideas about how we ought to use technology, and we can make those ideas real now. Let's instead of bombing the homes of civilians in order to sap their will and dis defeat our enemy, why don't we just identify the five most crucial military targets in that area and take them out? So famously, he launched a, 
attack on a ball bearing factory in a town called Schweinfurt in Bavaria. And Hansel's idea was, notion was, look, the Germans make all their ball bearings in Schweinfurt. Ball bearings are essential to every single mechanical object used in war. You cannot even build a bicycle without ball bearings. So let's take out their ball bearing um, manufacturing capacity, and they won't be able to make planes, tanks, jeeps, bicycles, garden carts. I mean, you name it, nothing, right? That's the way Hansel thought. He's like, why are you bombing the the home of the hospital or the the little old lady down the street or some children's school? No, no, no. Just take out the ball bearing factory, and they can't make anything. They can't wage war anymore. And so, or he would say, you know, if our big problem is the U is the German Air Force, let's just bomb the factories where they make their planes. Like, don't bother with anything else. Just take out the factories. That's, and he believed you could do that because he had the Norden bomb site. Because he said, look, I've got the technology to do this. But and then what happened when they actually tried to bomb that factory in Schweinfurt? Couldn't hit it. <laughs> but in the real world, trying to use this Norden bomb site to put a bomb inside a pickle barrel at 20,000 feet is well nigh impossible. So how was the war going to succeed? That's the other. There are two streams or more than two streams in this book. But as well as the stream of industrial bombing, there's a, a chemical side to this book. And one of the things that I was so fascinated to discover is like so many of your readers, you know, I had heard a great deal about the development of the atomic bomb during the Second World War. I had heard absolutely nothing about the development of napalm, and I hadn't even associated it with the Second World War. So tell us a little bit of that extraordinary story. Napalm, very early on in the Second World War, the United States are aware that they must defeat Japan in order to win. And they make an observation, many people do about J Japan, which is, their cities are quite unlike Western European cities. They are constructed um, not with wide streets, but with narrow streets. They don't have lots of parks. And most importantly, the homes and buildings are not made of brick. They're made of wood and tar paper. 